Silence in us, O God, any voice but your own. reading from the Gospel of Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gesenaret, and the, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Here's a great story circulating in my home state of Minnesota about the minister from somewhere in the south who had just taken up his post in the northern part of Minnesota in Ely. And that's the tundra, folks. And this minister had heard so much about ice fishing from his parishioners that he could just hardly wait to try it. So one morning in January, when the deep freeze had really set in, the minister set out with his brand new rod and reel and his ice auger to drill a hole and let down his line. And pretty soon he finds a really good patch of ice. And just as he starts to drill, he hears a loud, booming voice that says, you'll find no fish under that ice. Well, the minister looks around and seeing no one, he moves a little further along and resumes the drilling and then he hears again the loud, booming voice saying, you'll find no fish under that ice. Well, now the minister is awestruck, imagining that finally God is speaking to him and directing his life. So he falls on his knees, throws his arms up, looks up to the sky and says, God, is that you? And the voice comes back, No, Reverend, this is Oli Svensson, a member of your church and the manager of this hockey rink. <laughs> of course, the humor of the joke hinges on an awareness. Awareness that this naive new minister lacked, that waters that shallow aren't going to yield much, certainly not fish. Shallowness versus depth is in fact our subject for today. I ran across a fascinating book entitled The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. And its purpose is to explore, of all things, what the internet is doing to our brains. And you guessed it, the internet, much research is showing, is actually making us all, well, shallower. We have now left behind, to a large extent, the author says, the old printed medium books through which we recorded and stored and transmitted our best and deepest and most nuanced thinking. And though the method of in 
uh, information transmittal is now a little outdated, perhaps old-fashioned. Carr insists that we not forget that that old technology acquainted us with the vast imaginative mind of the Renaissance, the rational mind of the Enlightenment, the inventive mind of the Industrial Revolution. And now here's the point of the book. That kind of deeply probing mind may soon be gone, he says, because we are no longer training our brains to think in that kind of scope. Instead, we sort of skitter from here to there on the internet, we flip from web page to web page, we tap away at our keyboards, but we rarely read at much length, or frankly, at much depth. One humorist caught the shallow impulse of the new digital mind in a great little poem which reads, This is the age of the half-read page, the quick hash and the mad dash, and the plane hop and the brief stop, and the brain strain and the heart pain and the cat naps, till the spring snaps and the fun's done. Now that poem reads a bit like a text or Twitter shorthand message, doesn't it? And yes, in this digital age, who has time for elaborate sentence construction and eloquent phrasing, for subtlety or metaphor? But that's a little worrisome, don't you think? Because, of course, some of the most significant communications we have ever received employ just those time-honored but vanishing techniques. And I'm thinking, of course, of our scripture stories that convey so much if we're willing to probe a little more deeply. Take the richness of the story for today from Luke's Gospel about Jesus' call to the fishermen. There is a real depth of meaning embedded in this story that stretches far beyond the literal aspects of the shore, the boat, the water, the fish, the nets. It's a richly metaphoric tale that still resonates, I think, with us modern readers. And what does it have to say? Well, I think there are at least two significant aspects to this story, and the first does involve the actual fishing. Remember how the story unfolds? Jesus has been standing at the lake shore there at Galilee, and as usual, he's drawn such a big crowd that it's hard to be seen and heard. So he asks his friend, Simon Peter, to row him out a bit from shore in his boat where he can sit down and teach. And then finishing his teaching, he asks Peter to row him out much deeper, further from the shore, further from the noisy crowds, away from the home cove and its well-fished waters, out into the quiet deep and let down the nets. Well, Simon Peter objects a bit. Gee, we've been fishing all night, Jesus, and we haven't caught a thing. But perhaps out of respect, he rows out deeper, lets down the nets, and you know the rest. Out of that deep water come more fish than he has ever seen. Enough fish, in fact, to fill two boats to overflowing. Now, how do you understand that? Well, I suppose the story wants us to see that having Jesus in your boat certainly doesn't hurt your chances for successful fishing. <laughs> but there's another implication in this story, too, I believe that plying the same old, well-fished, shallow waters just doesn't yield abundance for your life. Not the kind of abundance that's available by striking out for some deeper waters. This story has something to say to us about depth. Now, I want to let you in on something. Virtually every time we clergy gather someplace, someone is bound to share a story about people they'd like to know how to help people who are miserable because for years they've refused to strike out for deeper water. These souls adrift have resources, but don't use them. Skills, but don't develop them. Dreams, but don't follow them. Gifts, but don't share them. Possessions, but don't dedicate them to any great purpose. Instead, they sit quietly in their boats in the shallow waters where there are no more fish to be had, just paddling around monotonously, and they complain or are dissatisfied or bored and wonder why nothing happens. Isn't there more to life? Well, when I hear these stories, it always makes me think, what kind of waters have I been floating along on recently? Just perhaps, are the waters I've been working too shallow? 
might some real abundance lie someplace in deeper water than I've been plying? Ever wondered about that yourself? Whether you've committed to a life course that's deep enough to really yield anything, where have you put down your nets? This story from Luke's Gospel seems to say that it does take some encouragement at times to go deeper, to take the risk of discovering new meaning and purpose, to embarking on some new and significant enterprise. It's risky, because in part, like Peter, James, and John in this story, if you try it, you may be caught yourself by the greatest fisherman of all time. And when he catches you in his great net of love, you just might drop everything else and follow. And yes, that would change everything. And that's the second aspect of the story from Luke's Gospel, you see. For if the first part is about catching fish, the second part is really about catching disciples. Jesus urges his disciples to follow him permanently, out into the deep water, and they need to make a momentous choice here. Will they spend their whole lives in the shallow waters pulling in the occasional minnow? Or will they follow him, where the catch is more abundant than they could ever imagine, where they won't pull in just minnows, but men and women to share the dream, to risk the adventure of whatever lies ahead with Jesus in the lead? And we know what they choose. So I think we see in this little story of Jesus and the disciples that given a little encouragement, any of us might just choose a path, perhaps a very difficult path, if it promises to shape us, to build our character, to change our world, to connect us with what really matters most. So if you were offered such a chance, would you take it? A wise theologian once said, the greatest sin we commit may be aiming too low with our dreams and aspirations. Do you have a demanding enough dream? Are you striking out for deeper waters, or are you floating around in the baby pool? What have you got to lose? As it's been said, if you tried to do something great and failed, you're still vastly better off than you try to do nothing and succeed. Or as the poet put it, there was a very cautious man who never laughed or played, who never risked, he never tried, he never sang or prayed. And when one day he passed away, his insurance was denied. For since he never really lived, they claimed he never died. <laughs> Now I know that it's easy to get kind of comfortable where we are and just want to stay put. We have a lot of justifications for that. And did you notice that in our story for today, Peter tried to send Jesus away so he could just stay with his boats and his nets in the shallows? But imagine having missed the opportunity to walk with the Messiah. But Jesus' call to Peter was persistent and persuasive. And I think that Christ's call comes to us that way, too. No excuses apply. Peter's excuse that he wasn't holy enough didn't impress Jesus. And our excuses really don't hold water either. We can't claim we're not ready to follow Christ on a path towards significance because we're not really prepared or we haven't yet developed the right skills or talents or maybe we just don't have the time or we're tired or we've already done our part. No. Our agendas and our resumes don't matter. Jesus didn't expect the vita of Peter and James and John. Frankly, he didn't pick the most capable of his day. He didn't call the brightest and the best, certainly not the best looking, the most eloquent, the most knowledgeable of scriptures and law, no. He just found people where they were, and he helped them to see how the skills they already had could be perfectly applied to the fulfillment of his dream of bringing God's kingdom closer. So what capability have you got that you could put to work in some new way? Maybe you're not a fisherman. Well, there are other talents. If Peter, James, and John were fishermen who could put their fishing skills to work for people, maybe you are a teacher, 
or a father, or a banker, or a mother, or a caring neighbor, a loving parent, a doctor, a spouse. Maybe you've learned a hard life lesson to share. Maybe you've learned compassion because of your own grief or hardship. Maybe you've discovered the steps that lead to success that you could share with someone who just hasn't experienced much success ever. Whatever skill it is that you're good at, have you really fully employed it in a way that Christ might encourage you to do? Couldn't we all cast our nets more widely, let them sink down more deeply, and let them bring up abundance for our lives and others? Now, that way of doing mission may sound a little haphazard, I suppose. But then, we people who are caught up in Christ's net have always been, frankly, kind of an odd assortment, aren't we? But together, think how the world has been changed by all of us who've made some commitment to be Christ's people. Think of the hospitals built, the schools and universities, the service agencies, the advocacy for children, for the lost and the lonely, the homeless, those without a voice. Just think of the billions of small, compassionate acts that have changed lives and inched us all a little closer to God's coming kingdom. You see, there's no set prescribed way to be Christ's people, to fish for men and women, though Christ promises that we all can do it. And part of the joy of the effort, I think, is that we can be as inventive and creative and unconventional as we choose to be. I just read a story by Tony Campalo from his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party. Campalo, you remember, preached here several years ago. He says in this book that he often stopped at a particular diner that happened to be the gathering place for girls working the streets in Philadelphia. And one night, Campalo overheard Gladys, one of those ladies of the evening, mention that the next day was her birthday. So Campalo and the owner of the diner quietly talked it over and planned an impromptu surprise party for Gladys the next night, complete with a birthday cake. So the next night, when Gladys came to the diner, her friends shouted, surprise, and sang happy birthday, and they urged her to cut the cake. But with quiet tears and a tight, choked-up voice, Gladys said, gee, I never had a cake before. If you don't mind, I'd just like to keep it a while. And at this point, Kampala said, amidst the stunned silence, he asked everyone in the diner if they would join him in a prayer for Gladys. So Kampala thanked God for Gladys's life and asked God's blessing on her. A little odd, perhaps, for a bunch of ladies of the evening to be having a prayer meeting in a diner, but that's how it happened. And when the party was over, the owner of the diner confronted Kampalo and he said, Hey, you never told me you were some kind of preacher. What church do you belong to anyway? And Kampalo answered, I belong to the kind of church that throws birthday parties for the lost and the lonely like Gladys and welcomes them in. And the owner of the diner was stunned for a moment, just incredulous, and then he says, Oh, no, you don't. There aren't any churches like that. If there were, I'd be part of it. Well, there are churches like that. Churches that cast their nets wide and deep. Churches that leave the job of judging to God and just keep throwing out the net of love Jesus taught us about and hauling in more precious fish than we know what to do with. And aren't we all proud to be part of the catch? Because make no mistake, if we're here in one way or another, we've already been caught. So what now? Well, listen, the whole world may indeed be languishing in pretty shallow waters these days, but we know there's more. We know the realm of God to which we are called and which we glimpse whenever we gather to worship remains boundless, deep, wide, vast, and always surprising. And we are called to enter it.
as deeply as we can to be part of engaging our world and its people, part of bringing in an abundant haul of goodness, compassion, support, justice, forgiveness, grace, however we can do it with whatever talent we've been equipped with. So let's do it. Let's be that kind of church. And who knows who may just wriggle into our net of love. Who knows who we may catch in Christ's name. We can't know because the rewards for that kind of work are really hard to predict, but don't you like knowing there is nothing shallow about that? Amen.